So my uh, objectives are to how to discuss uh, how the prevalence of migraine, how to diagnose migraine, and what are the current treatment options, and how the new treatment options fit into current practice. So next slide. The migraine is a common problem. So there's over 47 million Americans with migraine. It's the sixth leading cause of disability worldwide. And in terms of years lived with disability, back in 2013, it was ranked sixth. And in 2016, it was second. And so what years lived with disability is, so we all know strokes and things like that can cause a major amount of disability. But it's when patients are young that they have a lot of disability with migraine. And so this happens when they're in some of their most productive years. And so this is where they have more years lived with the disability. So that's one of the reasons why migraine is ranked so high. It actually accounts for over 50% of disability from neurological diseases. And it's extremely common. Over 15% of the US population has migraine with 18% of women and 6% of men. And over half are actually seen in the primary care setting. Next slide. So what causes migraine? So that's one of the big things that you'll hear all the time. So why do I have this? So if you're like me and you were taught in med school, it's a vascular, the, the vascular theory. Blood flows constrict, causing aura, followed by blood vessels dilating, causing pain. Next slide. However, it doesn't explain a lot of things. So um, it doesn't explain the prodrome that a lot of people get with migraine. And it's not actually supported by the blood flow studies. And then now we have a lot of new drugs that are the CGRP monoclonal antibodies, small molecules, and then our old school NSAIDs. Like these drugs are effective and they don't do vascular um, issues. So basically this old theory is not correct. Um, so what are some of the causes? So we know genetics do play a large role in it. 90% who have migraine have a family member who also have migraine. If one parent has migraine, you have a 50% chance of having migraine. And so then we look at, so what is actually causing it? So then there are these neuropeptides that get released that cause cortical spreading depression and inflammation. So then cortical spreading depression, sorry, next slide. So what is cortical spreading depression? You'll hear us talking about that a lot. So it's a self-propagating wave of neuron and glial depolarization that spreads across cerebral cortex. So think about it, just a wave of activating and deactivating um, activity that goes across. And we think of this as causing the aura of migraine, activating the trigeminal nerve afferents, and causing a blood vein and permeability alteration. So, um, and this activation upregulates some of the other proteases. Next slide. So then there's the trigeminovascular system. So there's small neurons in the trigeminal ganglia and the upper cervical dorsal roots. So this is where a lot of patients go, oh, but my, the back of my head and then my upper neck really hurts. Well, it's because all the sensory neurons project to the cerebral vessels and all that stuff and going to the nucleus called Dallas, that you get the anterior, posterior, upper neck pain. And so it makes sense from the current theory why it, we have the neck pain that we have. And when the trigeminal ganglia gets um, stimulated, then we get the release of substance P, CGRP, and neurokinin pain. And then that causes neuroinflammation, which then leads to sensitization. So I like this slide just because it kind of shows you where the trigeminal ganglia can get um, stimulated and the activation of these receptors. And once they get activated, the release of the neuropeptides. Next slide. So I talked about CGRP a little bit. 
Um, and CGRP is a big component of what we're treating right now and what we're doing with migraine. Um, and so what exactly is CGRP? So it's a neuropeptide found in the dura and the trigeminal ganglia. And as you can read here, it, it's on the mast cells causing mast cell degranulation, inflammation. It's found in the central and peripheral nervous system, okay? And it does a lot. Next slide. So when these trigeminal sensory, you get a big influx of the CGRP leading to the inflammation. Next slide. So we have found with migraine um, studies that if you actually give exogenous CGRP, we can trigger migraine attacks in individuals with a history of migraine. Um, we've actually also seen that blood and saliva levels of CGRP are elevated in people who have migraine, trigeminal neuralgia, and cluster headaches. And if we can get rid of and terminate the migraine, the CGRP levels normalize. Um, in people who have chronic migraine, these um, levels of CGRP are actually elevated in between attacks as well. So they've been looking at the elevated levels of CGRP as predictors and things like that. One of the problems of this as an actual good test right now is that it's really hard to get. So that's one of the areas where studies have been limited in um, what's the best tubes to draw it in, how long does it actually stay and stabilize and things like that. So it's not the greatest test just yet. Next slide. So then what is the test? We don't have one. So there is no single test. It is diagnosed based on the clinical symptoms. So this is how you diagnose it. Um, I like ICHD3. So I'm always looking when I was primary care, how do you actually know what's what? So if you Google ICHD3, it will tell you the diagnostic criteria for all of these headache disorders. So the actual diagnostic criteria is five attacks of a headache lasting four to 72 hours um, and having at least two of the following characteristics, unilateral location, pulsating quality, um, quality, moderate to severe pain intensity, aggravating by or causing avoidance of routine physical activity, and then during the headache at least one of the following, nausea and or vomiting, photophobia and phonophobia, and then not better accounted for. So next slide. What's one of the biggest things where we get pigeonholed, I guess? is that we want people to follow every single feature. And that's not right. Um, so 40% of patients have bilateral headache. 50% have non-pulsating. 20% of patients have mild headaches. Now, 95% of patients generally have worsening headaches with exertion. However, this can be sometimes more difficult than you think to get people to tell you. I had someone just yesterday tell me, I asked, you know, so does your pain get worse when you're doing something? No, no, absolutely not. Like, okay, what do you do when you have a headache? I lay down. Okay, does doing something make your headache worse? No. Do you always lay down? Yes, I can't do anything when I have a headache. Just. It, it, I, I cannot function when I have a headache. Okay. Um, associated symptoms, you can see the nausea is extremely common with migraine. Um, the photophobia and the phonophobia, you do need both though. So, next slide. Um, so, what are some other features that we can commonly see but are not diagnostic is predictable timing around menstruation, ovulation, um, stereotype prodrome symptoms, um, characteristic triggers where you're going, oh yeah, if this happens, I'm going to get a headache. Improved with sleep, 
um, if they have a history of childhood precursors like cyclic vomiting, abdominal migraines, vertigo, um, that's generally pretty typical. Next slide. So if you're like me, I was always concerned, still somewhat a little nervous about what am I missing? So what's something bad? Because as primary care, you're seeing them when they have the first couple of headaches and they're coming in really nervous. So what do, are you looking for? So the red flags of headache are SNOOP, okay? It's a nice little acronym, kind of like. So systemic symptoms, they have fever, weight loss, um, urinary tract infection type stuff. Neurological symptoms, are they weak? Are they having facial droop, things like that. Um, sudden onset, so me reaching maximum intensity in less than one minute, call those thunderclap headaches. Older age of onset, over 50. So this is, I find this one a little bit harder because they forget sometimes about their headaches that they had when they were little. Um, but so if you go back and ask, well, yeah, but this is different. So I go, okay, so that's a pattern change. So I would still investigate that if it's different. Um, precipitated by Valsalva, pregnancy, progressive, all of those things I would also work up. Next slide. So that whole different though, um, sometimes they go, oh, but I've had sinus headaches. And you go, wait, what? Oh, what? Um, so a lot of patients, and you have been there, I've had sinus headaches for years. Um, I live in Kentucky. They're all sinus headaches, right? No. No, if you actually get them to tell you and describe their sinus headaches, um, there's been a study that 86% of them have migraine. Only 3% were actually related to, si to their sinuses. So getting an actual like description of their headache. Does it pound? Is it one-sided? Is it worsened with activity? Um, you can see if it's truly sinus related or is it migraine that they keep getting around fall and spring every year? Next slide. So then the other thing I always heard and always wondered about was, am I missing cluster? So what is this clustering of the headaches, right? So next slide. Cluster is actually a primary headache. So cluster is completely different than migraine. Um, here again is the IHCHD3 criteria for cluster. It is a severe or very severe unilateral orbital, superorbital temporal pain lasting 15 minutes to 180 minutes. So 15 minutes to three hours. So it's a lot shorter than migraine and has ipsilateral to the headache, conjunctival injection, lacrimation, nasal congestion, eyelid swelling, forehead facial sweating, meiosis, ptosis, um, and then a sense of restlessness, okay? And then this curve occurs with a frequency of one every other day to eight per day. So. A migraine is one where they are under the bed with a constant head pain where they don't want to do anything. And a cluster headache is one where, think about the restlessness with a kidney stone, where they're just, ugh, they can't, they're not, but it's shorter acting, but they're not able to, to stop moving. So they're really restless with this pain. So that's kind of a good way to think about it. So what do most people, when they're saying cluster, actually think, next slide, is status. So status is a debilitating migraine that's unremitting for three days. So it lasts longer than three days. That's severe migraine. 
So it's where they're having a long migraine attack. So next slide. So how do we actually treat these? And we know now what migraine is. So we go, okay, we got a good idea. So how do we treat? Next slide. Um, so there's different strategies. There's rescue treatments and preventions, okay? So prophylactic or preventive therapy is where we go to a lot of the time. But keep in mind that the goal is reducing the, th the frequency, severity, and duration of attacks. We don't have a cure yet. There is no cure. So what is success actually defined as? It's decreasing the frequency or reduction as 50%. Next slide. So when do we actually choose a prevention medicine? It's not set in stone. There is no actual guideline. Um, so it's more, is the patient willing to take it? Do they want to? Are they failing their rescue medicine? Are they having a lot of disability from it? Next slide. Um, are they having attacks interfering with their daily routine despite treatments? Again, failing their, failing their acute treatments. Um, can they take acute treatments? Um, are they having medication overuse because of it? Are they having side effects? Are they having uncommon migraines with prolonged aura? So those are different reasons to go for prevention medications. Next slide. So what are the prevention medicines? Next slide. So generally when I start talking to patients and they've never been on a prevention, I tell them, so let's start with one of three oral types of medicines. So we start with antidepressants like amitriptyline, nortriptyline, the SNRIs like venlafaxine, um, Next slide. The anti-seizure medicines like topiramate, zanisamide, valproate, things like that. Next slide. Or blood pressure medicines like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, angiotensin. And these are useful when you have high blood pressure. If they, go ahead, next slide. If they go, I, no, 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 I'm not quite ready for the, those yet. I go, all right, would you like a vitamin? So these aren't as well studied as those other medications, mostly because of financing, big pharma. But if they would like to try some magnesium, um, you can use it 400 milligrams a day, it can cause some diarrhea, riboflavin, um, 25 to 400, and can discolor urine, um, telling the patients about the side effects that these aren't completely benign either. Um, and then CoQ and Zyme 10. I will mention Butterbur on here just because if they are going on the internet and finding Butterbur does have some of the best evidence, but it, um, the compounds that are out right now can have some liver toxicity. So checking liver enzymes if they are taking some over-the-counter supplements. Next slide. So say you've tried those three medicines though. They said, yes, I'm trying them and you failed. Then we go, all right, What's our next step? Then we have the migraine specific medicines. Next slide. So the CGRP monoclonal antibodies. So this is where we talked about the mechanism of action of migraine and why we talked about the CGRP so much. So it's becoming one of the main ways of treating chronic migraine. They have long half-lives making them ideal for chronic disease and they target specific sites, so have really low side effects. Next slide. So what are the CGRPs out there currently? So we have four. We have irinumab, frenizumab, glavonizumab, and eftinizumab. So three of the four IM injections, um, these are once a month to, to once every three months injections. Um, three of the four medications are targeting the CGRP protein the inurinumab um, targets the receptor. Um, the responder rate, so the 50%, which means we're trying to decrease by 50%, um, is fairly even across the board. Next slide. Um, you'll see this from some of the others. And if you look at the placebo to the dose, 
you'll notice that they all have about the same. So you're really comparing apples to oranges with the different um, levels there when you're going, oh, but it's up here 59 versus you know 48, but you go, well, look at the comparison to the placebo. So next slide. So, so far there's been no clinically significant changes in EKGs. I will say um, I, I had changed the slide before I had sent it, after I sent this to them, so I apologize. There has been a slight increase in blood pressure with one of the monoclonal antibodies, um, but there's been no hepatic enzymes um, changes. They don't cross the blood-brain barrier, which also shows that CGRP um, is acts peripheral in migraine. Next slide. So what are some of the concerns? So CGRP is a potent vasodilator. So it has raised concerns in what happens during ischemia when we're blocking CGRP. Don't know. Um, what are the long-term effects on CGRP with um, over ischemia? And then CGRP is found outside of the nervous and vascular system. It's found on the adrenal glands, kidneys, pancreas, bone, and we are not 100% sure what effects this antagonism may have on these organs. And then pregnancy. So um, we are not currently recommending these during pregnancy, nor for six months prior to becoming pregnant at this time. So next slide. Um, the side effects currently, so in Renumab does have a 3% constipation and post-marketing data just recently came out with developed or worsening hypertension within seven days of the first dose. Um, it is the only one, this is the one that blocked the receptor, not the protein, so it is different than the other three. Eptonizumide has a 6% rate of nasopharyngitis and the others just have site reactions as they're most common. Next. And just briefly, onobotulism toxin A, if um, all else fails, we can do the uh, onobox. Um, it inhibits pain sensing neurons and suppresses some of the muscle trigger points and inflammatory neuropeptides. We also can block some of the CGRP and things like that with that. So next slide. Um, if your patients ask, it is 31 injection sites. Um, across the forehead, the temples, and the back of the neck. And it's done every three months. Next slide. So I like this slide a lot because as primary care, you, I always was going, so which ones actually work? I just, I want to know which ones work. I'll use those. So the American Headache Society came up with a consensus statement. Um, you know, as I mentioned those three classes that I used first, so they came out with established efficacy, probable efficacy, and possible effectiveness. Um, so the established, they have the anti-epileptic drugs that have the established efficacy, and that's Dalproevix, um, Valproic, and Topiramate. The beta blockers that have the most efficacy is the metoprolol, propanolol, and timolol, um, whereas the probable ones are atenolol and nadolol. So, and then the antidepressants are in the probable ones. So, and as you go down, this is where you'll also see some of the meds I didn't mention earlier, like antihistamine, ciproheptidine, um, and other anti-epileptics like carbamazepine. So you'll see that the CGRP monoclonals aren't on this, but they do have established efficacy as I showed earlier. So next slide. So for prevention, the first ones you choose is based on comorbidities and the tolerable side effects that they're going to have. Um, patients often end up on more than one for prevention to get to that goal of 50% reduction. And due to the cost of CGRPs and Botox, um, generally they have had to have failed two or three of those other classes. Um, most insurance companies want them to have failed um, the anti-epileptic um, blood pressure medications and the um, 
antidepressant medicines before they will cover the other. Next slide. So then rescue meds. If they go, doc, I just need something. I'm having one headache a month. What can I, I, I just need something for rescue. So what do, what do we have? Next slide. So what's our goal first? So it's um, to achieve relief of pain, associated symptoms, and disability within two hours. And to take it less than two times a week to prevent medication overuse. Um, next slide. So real quick, it's important to actually treat acute headaches fast and with a bigger dose to try and prevent allodynia, um, which for those who don't know, allodynia is defined as pain resulting from stimulation that would normally not be perceived as nauseous. noxious. Um, this can be the tingling of the scalp and things like that. It's what happens when the migraine has gone on long enough that it sensitized part of the other neurons and it makes the tryptans not very effective and migraines much harder to treat acutely. Next slide. The other thing is unlike the other conditions, you want to use higher doses initially and then back down due to the side effects. Um, because like I tell my patients, so think of, so you have the release of all those chemicals. So you're wanting to block the release as soon as possible, as much as possible. So um, the more chemicals, the more seed or neuropeptides that you get released in the brain, the longer you get them released and the more sensitive your brain gets, the less likely you are to get release relief and the harder it's going to be for you to get relief. Next slide. So meds we have that we've used for a while are NSAIDs. They're, they can be used in combination with a ton of other medications. They're not sedating. They actually can help some of the allodynia. Um, the problem with NSAIDs is because they're available over the counter, they're big for using um, med having medication overuse headache. Um, next slide. So some of the NSAIDs available, ibuprofen, naproxen, diclofenac, ketorolac, just some of the ones we use. Next slide. Then there's butabitol. So it's a combination product. Um, the side effects include incoordination, inhibition, memory problems. So the problem with butabitol is if you use it for extended periods of time and you stop it, we can cause withdrawal seizures. And then it's one of the biggest offenders of medication overuse headache. So studies with this one have shown that more than five times a month. So you don't have to use it very often to cause medication overuse headache. Next slide. Opioids, worth mentioning, but we don't really use them often. Um, they're not well absorbed, they're associated with increased nausea and sedation, and can lead to physical dependence and medication overuse headache again. Next slide. Um, so one of the reasons, don't want to harp on this too much, but they're bad, is um, again, they actually have done a study showing that they can lead to worsening severe headache-related disabilities, moderate to severe depression, worsening anxiety, and and worsening headache days per month. So while very short term, if you're all else fails and are married, you may want to try one, but they're not a great medicine for long-term use for headaches. Next slide. So I mentioned medication overuse headache a couple of times now. So what is it? So it's headache present more than 15 days a month with regular overuse for more than three months of a symptomatic medicine. And it can make the headaches worse. So, and then after you stop the medicine, the headache reverts to its previous pattern within two months. So that's the big thing is two months. Um, next slide. So what causes it? Most of our old um, treatments. So the simple analgesics, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, aspirin, combinations, butabitol, the opiates, even our triptans and DHE. So it's there. 
So here is how often it takes. Butabitol is as little as five days, opioids as little as eight days a month, and the triptans and NSAID as little as 10 days. So there, there. So um, moving on, what are some of our other medicines? There are triptans. Um, next slide. So triptans work on agonists at the FEV-HT1B and 1D serotonin receptors, um, which can cause some vasoconstriction. Um, so these are contraindicated in vascular diseases. Um, they also work a little bit at 5-HT1F. But next slide. So where that comes in is their side effects for triptans. So they do narrow the coronary blood vessels by 10 to 20 percent. So again, they are contraindicated with coronary or cerebrovascular disease. The other side effects is they can cause some tightness in the throat, chest, jaw, neck, and limbs. And people sometimes say they have cold, hot sensations. For the most part, if you tell people, it's most likely due to a vasoconstriction, not a esophageal spasm, not really most likely their heart. They tolerate them okay. Next slide. So these are some of the triptans. Um, you can also, generally with the choice of triptans, because there are a few, um, it's how fast you want the triptan to be in there versus the side effects. Some of the slower acting triptans have less side effects or people are able to tolerate them better than the fat, more rapid acting ones. The rapid acting ones may help a little bit better for other people. If they're really nauseous, you may want to use um, the dissolvable ones, disintegrating ones, um, nasal sprays, things like that. So it all depends on what's going on with the patient, which triptan you actually choose. Next slide. Um, then there's DHE. So nausea with it is its major side effect. It actually can increase nausea, then decrease nausea. So it's also contraindicated with people who have vascular and coronary artery disease. Right now, um, it's mostly used in hospital with IV. Um, it does have a um, intranasal one um, that can be used. They're trying to come out with an orally inhaled one. Maybe on the market soon, may not be. Um, they're currently being studied at microneedle patch, sublingual films, um, those those are still in early trials, early studies. So it'll be a while before they're out. Next slide. So again, with the American Headache Society consensus statement, the established efficacy, triptans, ergotamine, NSAIDs, opioids are on there, and the combination meds. And then you have some probable effectiveness um, because you notice I said a lot of coronary artery spasms and coronary artery disease contraindications for those meds. Um, so a lot of things we used to use were some of the antimatics with metoclopramide, promethazine, clochlormethazine, things like that. Um, this came out in April of 2019. Since then, um, we have gotten some new medicines. Next slide. So triptans, again, worked on 1B, 1D um, nerves to block those re the release of those um, neuropeptides, cause vasoconstriction. There are now G-pants, which are selective CGRP receptor blockades um, that block just CGRP, does not cause vasoconstriction. And there's lismidodan. Lismidodan also works on the nerves, but it just blocks 1F. So it also blocks CGRP, nitric oxide, glutaminate, and it does not cause coronary artery vasoconstriction. Next slide. So lismidodan, again, just reiterating, it's a 5-HT1F receptor. Doesn't work on receptors of the heart, unlike the triptans, no vasoconstriction, can be highly affected, but um, can be well tolerated. Next slide, or ne hit it. The problem with it is it is a Schedule V controlled substance. Um, so it was studied and it can cause some sedation, um, some feelings of euphoria. Um, and if you ever look up how those were studied and it, it's now rated as a controlled substance, um, it is interesting. Next slide. So 
It is effective. So in the Samara and Spartan phase three trials, they had 28 and 39% of patients with pain freedom at two hours, and that is pain freedom, not pain relief, compared to 15 and 21% of placebo. The side effects did include driving impairment and increased sedations. So it is recommended that patients do not drive for eight hours after taking this medication. So that is the downside of this medicine. Then there's the G-Pants. So the G-Pants just blocks CGRP ligand at its receptor in the central and peripheral nervous system. So it does both. Um, next slide. So what G-Pants are available, or uh, sorry. Um, so it is well tolerated and low risk medication overuse can be taken with tryptans processed through the liver. Next slide. So currently there are two G-Pants on the market. Um, there are two more coming out. So there's Remojapant and Remijapant currently out. They are only for acute migraine treatments. Um, Remijapant is a dissolvable, the Remojapant is a tablet. Um, the frequency is as needed currently. Pain freedom at two hours is about 20% of patients. Um, they were available in January and February. Um, the other two are not quite out yet. Atojapan is going for prevention. Um, the other one is a nasal spray and is also going to be acute. Next slide. So the side effects so far, Ubrojapan, 2% to 4% nausea, somnolence 2 to 3% dry mouth, less than 1 to 2 and Remijapant, 2%. Next slide. So the problem with these is they can have, they are processed through the liver, so can have some decreased effectiveness with um, some of the barbiturates, phenytoin, or thampin, and pregnancy and nursing. Um, so in studies with very high doses, not the ones we use for people, um, there was some fetal toxicity and fetal loss in animal testing. So these are not recommended during breastfeeding or pregnancy. Next slide. So status treatments. So um, you've tried your treatments and you're going, what do I do? Um, their tryptan's not working. This isn't working. What, what am I doing? Because they've had a headache now for four days. Next slide. So research studies have shown that dexamethasone, four milligrams, ketorolac, nerve blocks and neurotriptan may be some effective treatments. Um, some of the studies show from 10 to 30 percent effectiveness. Other studies have shown 80 percent effectiveness with dexamethasone, so it all depends on the study you look at to see how effective they can be. Next slide. So if they go to the emergency department, the American Headache Society actually has some guidelines on what should be offered and what may be offered. Um, so level B evidence is, you know, level better than um, the other. So sumatriptan injectables, metoclopramide IV, prochlorpinazine IV, and then you can, I'm not going to read the what you may offer, but there are other things that you can offer. The big thing that they're trying to get away from is the opioids um, for acute migraine because they generally don't work there. Next slide. Um, and so Patients, though, can get confused. Well, when do I go? What do I do when, when it's not working? So you may want to offer a migraine action plan because um, lots of times when they come in, they're having a headache. They don't remember what you say. So I'll sometimes just write it down and go for daily headache for prevention, you're taking this. For as needed, when you have a mild headache, take this. When you have a severe headache, take this. What do you do when it doesn't go away? When are you calling the office? When do you go to the ER? Um, if you don't want to write it down, like our asthma, like asthma action plans, the American Headache Society came out with a migraine action plan. Um, next slide. Um, they, this is a really busy slide, but they look like this. Um, so this just has all the tryptans, all the NSAIDs, any anti-nausea medicine that you may use, and it shows when you take, take them. Um, the one thing I do really like about these is if you go to the next slide, you'll see things that you can do if they're not going away and going to the urgent care emergency department because it has things about going 
not wanting to do the opioids, the butabatols and things like that. So it kind of gives you an idea of what we might use in the whole emergency setting or what we go, oh, this is bad. This is, you know, weakness, vision loss, vision changes, things like that to look for. So next slide. So in review, migraine is not just a headache. It's a complex neurological condition, but it is extremely common and you will see it in your office's primary care. Um, prevention can help decrease medication overuse and there are new medications and treatment options for people who can't tolerate tryptans. So next slide. So I have a case, um, what, a, a question for you all. So we have a 56 year old female with a history of coronary artery disease, hypertension and migraine coming in for a, with a history of severe headaches. These just happen four days a month, but the pain is unilateral throbbing with photophobia and phonophobia. You will never get this history straight from the patient. Um, she will get nauseated and has issues getting out of bed for eight hours. What are her treatment options? This is the pool. So if you guys want to, um, you can click your answers or what you think you can give her now. So that's right, any of the above. So lismitidan is an option, the G pants are an option, prevention is an option, vitamins if she doesn't want, injections, we can do injections, but any of the above. So, um, and then last slide. Sorry. Um, so just for um, resources that I find helpful, um, I like the American Headache Society consensus statement showing which meds are some of the most beneficial. Um, they'll send out the resources to everyone at the end. Um, I like the ICHD3 and all of that i think it's a great website if you're ever confused and you're going eh, it doesn't make sense um so thank you very much and i'll 